every gunsmith tells a story. It could be right out of their mouth. It could be via the tools that they use. In this video, I'm with master gunsmith and instructor Fred Zeglin. We're going to tell some of those stories. Well, Fred, thank you for coming to the Ultimate Reloader Ranch. Thank you so much. It's fun to be here, and it's really been fun to see the tour of the place and see what it's really like. Yes. The video tells a story, but it's a little bit different when you're actually motoring around in the side-by-side. -side. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> and, and I was really impressed with uh, all the roads you've cut up to the top, and it's a lot of fun to look at that. Yes, I have to give credit to Adam, the Cat D5 operator that made that happen. Good stuff. So let's start. We're, we're going to talk about gunsmiths. We're going to talk about gunsmithing tools. Let's start with you. Tell us your story. Um, well, you know, when I was a little kid, I think I was about seven years old, my dad got me the quintessential Daisy Red Rider type lever action BB gun. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was my first shooting experience. And I knew that my dad was a hunter and stuff, so naturally you kind of have that urge to follow dad's footsteps and stuff. And um, so that got my interest in firearms started. Mm -hmm. And um, from there on, you know, it was the usual things that kids get to do. You get to go shoot the 22 with dad. And, oh, yeah. And I remember being a teenager and, and going to the range with him, and it was the first time I got to shoot the big game rifle, you know, and he had a .30-06. <laughs> and I remember I got up and I was going to shoot offhand, and I felt like I was shaking too much, so I kind of went over to a pole, and I kind of leaned my hand against the pole to steady myself, and he goes, I don't think you want to do that, <laughs> you know. So, you know, luckily he said something, because, yeah. you know, I've seen a lot of first-time shooters get a minor injury or get scared and then they lose interest. So, sure, sure. So I consider that a very important thing in now, terms of training new shooters. Tell me about that moment because I remember the first time I shot anything big, it was a 12 gauge shotgun. Right. And let me tell you, I was nervous. Right. Big time nervous. So when that 30 out six round went off, what was that like as a kid? Well, <laughs> as I recall, it was um, exciting. You know, that was that first chance to shoot that big gun and <laughs> and really learn something new about what it's like to shoot a big gun. Yep. But what was interesting was um, my dad's gun was an old school like Bishop stock with a lot of drop at the butt and stuff. Hmm. And so the recoil was horrendous. I mean, com <laughs> compared to your average 30-06, it was probably more like shooting a 375 H&H. &H. Wow. It was, it was nasty. So huh. I remember going, why does he like doing this? Right. You know, um, but then we got to shoot other guns and I found that that was kind of an exception. Yeah. You know, and uh, so it became more interesting to move on once I realized I wasn't getting it beat to death every time. So the moral of the story, if you have kids, maybe start them with a bolt action 223 or yeah. something reasonable, maybe a 308. Yeah. yeah. And I always <laughs> recommend, yeah, I always recommend new shooters start, especially center fire, with something mm -hmm. moderate. Because you don't want to scare them with the noise and the mm -hmm. recoil. And I know some guys think it's kind of funny to see that reaction. Sure. But you need to realize that that reaction might be lifelong. And mm -hmm. now you've lost a hunting partner or a shooting partner. Sure. Uh, that could have been one of your best friends at the range. Or your kids are playing video games instead of shooting with you, right? <laughs> right, right. Because now the, now the reality of shooting wasn't any fun. Yep. But shooting like this is great. Yeah. So. so early childhood experiences, exposure to rifles and whatnot. When did you catch the bug? Um... So I remember in high school, we did an aptitude test. Mm -hmm. And the aptitude test came back that the two things that I was ultimately qualified for was a gunsmith and an undertaker. <laughs> and it didn't take me long to figure out that I really didn't want to do the undertaker job. Yeah. Um, but it, I didn't immediately go to gunsmithing. So I mm -hmm. uh, got out and I took a two-year degree uh, in business. So mm -hmm. got that out of the way right away. And I tried going on to four-year college, but it bored me to death, so I mm -hmm. quit. <laughs> and uh, I went to work and got a job in uh, a hardware chain and was working my way up the corporate ladder. Got my first corporate screwing within six months. Mm -hmm. And I realized right away that I had two problems. One is I really didn't like authority. Yep. <laughs> so I don't play well with others. And the other one was um, it just was not fun to have somebody else have control over my life. Yeah. So... Um, that's when I said, I gotta go back to school and do something I really wanna do. Mm -hmm. And I did a little looking and I remembered that whole aptitude test. And uh, I found out that there was a gunsmithing school where I lived, and, and at that time it was free tuition. Oh, wow. Yeah, so um, it was a um, junior college in California, um, Lassen College. Hmm. And, um, in California, that's good. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. Free gunsmithing school in California. I'm guessing you're not going to roll across that too often in LA yeah. nowadays. <laughs> yeah. And I guarantee you that school's not free anymore either. But, yeah, right. But um, <laughs> it was fun to go there. It was in the mountains. So mm -hmm. we were, one side of town was high desert and the other side was alpine. Nice. So, so you could go one way and shoot jackrabbits and go the other way and shoot deer. Very cool. Um, so it was uh, really a nice place to go to school and learn. Mm -hmm. um, the guy who ran the gunsmithing school when I was there was uh, Bob Dunlap, who has just recently passed away. About a year ago, he passed away. Mm -hmm. And Bob was a super character. You know, I mean, he um, he loved teaching. He loved uh, playing practical jokes mm -hmm. and uh, loved telling jokes. I don't retell very many of his jokes because they were usually pretty off color. <laughs> um, but um, some of the practical jokes and stuff are, are really fun to remember nice. things that went on. Yeah. Um, so finished school there. And um, then I went and worked for a, a regular shop doing just retail for a little while mm -hmm. and eventually found a job uh, in a gunsmithing shop and moved to northern Idaho. I was in Coeur d'Alene for a number of years. Okay. Yeah. And in that shop, it was mostly general repair. You moved from California to Coeur d'Alene? Yep. See, he started it. <laughs> All those home prices. Yep. Anyways. They, well, and a lot of them <laughs> followed me. Yeah, I got exactly. There, I got center. there beforehand. Nice. Yeah. When I first got there, you could buy a house for about $25,000, a, a decent starter home. Mm -hmm. And those same homes now are selling for, you know, two fifty, three hundred thousand. dollars $300,000. Yeah. You know, and, and some of that happened while I was there. So It's crazy. Yeah. So how did you enjoy that, that job in that first gunsmithing shop gig? You know, it actually turned out to be a, a really fun place to work because um, we did some custom rifle, but we did mm -hmm. a lot of repair. So I really got to hone my skills and improve upon what I'd learned. When you go to gunsmithing school, oftentimes the school wants you to believe that you have the world by the butt. Mm -hmm. You know, we've taught you everything you need to know, kid. Go out there and make money. Right. And the reality is, you've, if you did a good job at school, if you took full advantage of the program, you learned enough to really get your feet under you and get started. Yep. You're capable of going out by yourself and learning the rest. Yeah. And not all students understand that. Some of them mm -hmm. believe the advertising. <laughs> right. And that makes life hard because you go out and get beat up pretty quick when you really don't know what sure. you're doing. Yeah. But I was lucky enough. I landed in a shop with uh, owners that had tons of experience. One of them um, had done a lot of gunsmithing on his own. And mm -hmm. he wasn't professionally trained, but he had worked with some of the best guys in the industry over the years. Yeah. So he'd learned a lot of tricks. He loved machinery. He collected machines. Mm -hmm. So... It was a little bit like your shop. There, everywhere you looked, there was a different machine and for mm -hmm. a different purpose, and some of them were specialty. And it was it was very uh, a very good place to land because then I got a lot mm -hmm. of experience with that equipment. Um, from there, I went to Southern California, and I worked for a shop that specialized in um, Colt and Winchester restorations. Mm, wow! So we did museum quality kind of work. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was there, one of the things that I felt that I had to do was I had to start marking my work because. People were taking Colts and Winchesters and stuff that we had redone, and they'd just stress them a little bit and then go out and try and pawn them off as good collectible guns. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you restore a gun, it, it has value, but it's only 70% maybe of a, sure. of a legitimate original gun. Yep. And um, so there's a lot of money to be made in that faking. Right. And um, my ethics won't allow that. So mm -hmm. I had a stamp made up that looks like a cowboy hat with a Z in it. <laughs> we'll come back to that later. Okay, yep. <laughs> so, um, and I actually sent that off to the Cody Museum just so they'd have a record of who it was. Nice. Um, and they actually sent me back a nice little letter that said, thank you for doing that because we often get markings mm -hmm. that we don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. So they like having that reference. Um, so I worked there for several years. Then I switched to another shop that was almost entirely handgun work. Hmm. Um, lots of 1911s, mm -hmm. lots of self-defense guns. Um, it was kind of funny because they would get in used rifles and put them on the rack for sale, and they would almost always be way underpriced because the people in his shop were there for handguns. Oh, okay. So nice. I loved it because I'd walk <laughs> down the rack and go, oh, look at that one. You yep. know? And so I picked up some good guns while I was there, not, you know, just because it was a chance to get some good quality guns for a low price. Yeah. You know, um, Worked for him for uh, two or three years, and then my wife had an opportunity to move us back to Wyoming where I'd grown up mm -hmm. uh, through her job. So we packed up and I moved to Wyoming without a job and without a location to go to, hmm. just wow. relying on her, on her job. So uh, I found a guy there in town that had an empty building that was, he sold guns in another, it was like a, a big storefront like from downtown, so he had mm -hmm. three, three slots. 
he was selling guns and other stuff in one slot, and there was a beauty salon, and then <laughs> my slot. <laughs> and, That's uh, perfect. The, the lady goes into the, the beauty salon, the guy might wander into right. the gun shop, maybe, I don't right. know. Well, and the best part about it was it was in Casper, Wyoming, and Casper had a long history of oil field and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that part of town's called the Sandbar, hmm. and that was where all the whorehouses were. <laughs> so my shop was actually in the ground floor of one of the biggest whorehouses in Casper, Wyoming. Wow. Which I'm sure the city fathers would hate to have me tell you that story, but <laughs> it doesn't bother me a bit. <laughs> but uh, it made for fun, because guys would come down and they'd go, oh man, you're in the Sandbar, this is cool. You know, uh -huh. they, they knew the local history. Gotcha. So. Yeah, but um, so I that basically I ran that shop by myself, and um, the way I paid my rent was I gave a portion of the proceeds to the guy that owned the building, mm -hmm. and it was kind of funny when he interviewed me. He goes, "Well, he says, why don't you move in and, and start doing business?" And he says, "I'll give you thirty percent." I said, "No, I'm going to put my tools in my garage and I'm going to go to McDonald's." Right. <laughs> he goes, "What do you mean?" You know, and I said, "Well, I've been at this a long time. Thirty percent won't even pay to keep the lights on." Sure. So we're not doing that. I said, right. I said if you want to talk seriously, mm -hmm. we'll talk. So by the time the conversation was over, he basically said, you know, I'll just give you the building. You just give me some money. Nice. You know, and um, so that was a good relationship. We worked together for quite a while. Um, he was kind of funny because he had very strong opinions, which in the gun business is rare. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he, um, uh, I remember he came down the hall one day. We had a hallway that connected us along the back mm -hmm. of the building. Mm -hmm. And he came down the hallway and he walked in and I was talking to a customer and we were doing a wildcat that's in the hawk manual and okay. the stuff I got with us. Yep. And it was a 375 hawk. And he looked at it and it's a, it's on a 30 out six case. Mm -hmm. And he says, Well, it's been proven that a 375, you know, just won't work on a 30 out six case. And I thought for a second and I looked at him and, and mind you, this guy's kind of my boss, you know, yep. my landlord. Yeah. I look at him, I go, so you're trying to tell me that a 30, 375 bullet knows who's kicking it in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> and he kind of went, oh, my. Okay, yeah. Back down the hall he went. Actually, I, you hit on something really important here. I think a lot of people expect to be able to go to gunsmithing school and work for a shop or work on their own and to be able to make a living. And I've heard time and time and time again how difficult that be and how, you know, how little you can make. So. What I would encourage people to do is really look at a different type of business model, right? You didn't take what was given to you, right? Right? Oh, I'll own the business, you get 30%, right? Uh, you gotta think real critically around, you know, if I'm a generalist, what kind of money can I make? Or a specialist, or certain types of products, certain types of guns that you could build, right? There's, there's no guarantee for success like any entrepreneurial venture, right? but there is money to be made. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I always say the riches are in the niches, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that's kind of a self-explanatory statement. If you specialize in something that people truly have an interest in, mm -hmm. you're going to have an audience. Yeah. And if you become the expert in that niche, mm -hmm. then you automatically guarantee yourself an income. Yep. The interesting thing about that is like when I did the, the Hawk Wildcats, that became my draw card for people to recognize what my business was mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. to focus on me a little bit. Yeah. But what ended up happening was I probably only made 20% of the guns I built in those calibers. Mm -hmm. I built lots of standard caliber stuff, you know, r standard factory cartridges. Sure. Yep. And some Wildcats for people, which was, was a nice addition to the business. You kind of, that was part of my niche was not only did I have this line of Wildcats, but yep. I could do custom dies and stuff like that for customers. Yep. And that's fairly rare. There's, there's more of it now than there was 20, 30 years ago. Uh, there's more guys who've come into the market and realized mm -hmm. that offering dies can be a big boon to their business. Yep. Um, and I'm not claiming I had anything to do with that. I think it's just something people start to realize what's missing in the market. Yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I did the the Hawk Wildcats initially, I had no intention of doing a reloading manual or anything like that. <laughs> uh, it's just for you know I gathered information for ten years, and pretty yeah. soon you've got this this big book full of reloading information and mm -hmm. how to form brass and what kind of brass to use and which dies and you know and you kind of go well well I might as well put this all together and and make it available because I had a by that time I had a lot of guns sold so there were a lot of people who wanted the information yeah you know um, the only thing the only negative I've had from that is I did have one guy send me a note and say I don't understand why you wrote this reloading manual it only covers these weird wildcats and there's no other cartridges in there 
I'm like, that's why it's called Hawk Cartridge's <laughs> <Right>. Manual. <laughs> so so that's an interesting career trajectory. I love the fact that you used something that was specialty oriented that would get people's attention and capture their imagination, even if they wanted to order, you know, standard calibers. Sure. Tell me how that paved the way for you to become an, an instructor and then eventually to own 40 Rima rentals. Okay, so basically what happened was the um, wildcatting put me in touch with people I would never have met otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, I got a call from Dean, Arl Dean Arnold, who was the head of the uh, gunsmithing program at Tishomingo in, in Oklahoma. Hmm. Um, it's actually Murray State College. And he said, hey, I'd like you to come teach a wildcatting class for us for the NRA program in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I've never taught before. I'm not sure about that, you know. And he said, well, he said, let me explain to you the benefits of teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, so his sales pitch to me, and that legitimately it was a sales pitch, was um, you come here, you get a vacation from your shop for a week. We pay you some money. You won't make <laughs> as much as you do working in your shop, but mm -hmm. you'll make some money. And um, you get to talk to people about what you're good at and share your passion. Mm -hmm. And that sounded sounds a lot like when I started my YouTube channel, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, and it, and you know, so you understand too this whole passion thing. It's yeah. Um, you know, when I got that first BB gun and got that mm -hmm. bug for playing with guns and doing stuff, um, that stuck, and that passion is still there. I still love to talk guns. I still love to go to the range and shoot. Mm -hmm. I don't do it as much as I used to because I'm so busy running the business. Sure. But. Um, it, that never goes away. Mm -hmm. And so after I taught once for an NRA class, then I did it several times, mm -hmm. you know, different. I've actually taught at um, three different schools doing that. And um, I did the Wildcat class several times. I did one on 22 relining. I did one on 1911s. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. whatever I had the knowledge for, I was willing to teach. Yeah. Um, so when I moved to Kalispell, that was uh, I'm getting a little bit ahead if you want to get all the history, I guess. But <laughs> when we left Casper, that's when I closed down my business, which was um, Z Hat Custom, which was uh, custom rifles based on the hot cartridges and mm -hmm. general custom rifles. And, and mm -hmm. that was a fun business for me because that's where I got to the point where I could refuse all repair work right. and just do custom rifles. Focus on what you enjoy doing right. the and, most, yeah. And the two things that I did in, in Z Hat was I did custom bolt guns. Mm -hmm. and I did custom lever actions. And the lever actions were the, like, 1895, mm -hmm. you know, so aught six size, because they lent, the, lent themselves well to those conversions. And there were a lot of them around in 270 at the time, the Winchester debacle where they brought them in in 270. Mm. Nobody wanted them. <laughs> so I converted a lot of them to 35 Whalen, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And those were easy jobs because the only thing to do to, to rebarrel one of those, it's a flat breech with one extractor cut, mm -hmm. real simple one dovetail for the forearm hanger and you're done. Hmm. And then whatever sights or scope mount or mm -hmm. whatever the customer wants. We should build one sometime. It's fun stuff. I, I'd love to learn it from you, seriously. Yeah. yeah. Um, I even did those in takedowns where we did, um, it's a Thomas Bland takedown hmm. where it's a full thread mm -hmm. and then you just have a screw with a half head so that cool. it, it locks it in place. Yeah, I like that. Um, really fun to do and pretty darn effective. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, when we left Casper, closed down Z hat. I had already bought four D Reamer rentals and it was a natural sideline for me. It was I can use all of my knowledge from gunsmithing and mm -hmm. rent gunsmithing tools all over the country. It's all mail yep. order so I don't really have to go anywhere or do anything. It's just a nice mm -hmm. sideline. Yeah. Well, we moved to Kalispell because I had an opportunity to go there and run McGowan Barrels. I was their production manager for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And um that was fun. I got to use all that gunsmithing knowledge. And by then I had so much business background that I understood what production was and what it had to be. Yep. And um, so my job, of course, was to expand production as much as I could and uh, try and manage employees to the best of my ability and that sort of <laughs> thing. I did have a reputation for firing people enough that they wanted to put the Grim Reaper on my office door. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but the guy I worked for that owned the build business told me, he says, you know, hire slow and fire fast. Gotcha. So yeah. we tried to hire good people, and when something didn't work out, let's not waste money and time on this for anybody. Yeah. You know? Yep. Um, so anyway, while I was there doing that, I was still running 4D. Mm -hmm. um, and teaching at the college a little bit um, for their NRA program. Mm -hmm. uh, and because of the NRA program we were doing at the college, the um, Occupational Trades 
portion of the college caught wind because we were using their facilities. They kind of caught wind of <laughs> how this was drawing people in from all over the area and people were willing to spend money to come and spend money to stay in a hotel for a week. Yep. And they kind of kind of dawned on them, maybe there's a market here for some training that people want because, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, colleges are supposed to be nonprofit, but the truth is even a nonprofit's a business. Sure. You know, so. And if it's not run like a business, then it probably has deeply dysfunctional things going on. Absolutely. And of course, all, <laughs> all institutional things are kind of dysfunctional. But, sure, yeah, but it's, it's um, not reality. <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> but the truth is they at least recognized that there was an opportunity there. Yeah. And um, so they came to me when the NRA program was kind of dwindling mm -hmm. a little bit. And it's, it was only dwindling because you have to have people who can run it. You have to have um, people who have enough knowledge of the industry to be able to get the right teachers in. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't have a huge budget because they were fairly new to it, you know, and we've got a number of schools across the country that have a lot of, of experience with that and have ongoing programs that suck up a lot of the best teachers. Yeah. So it was difficult for, I did it for a little while, one of my friends did it for a little while, um, and um, we just came to the conclusion that it was going to be easier to do a full-time program than to do this summertime program and have yeah. all the travel expenses and all that. Sure, yeah. So um, the college actually came to me and said, we'd like to do this program, will you write the curriculum? And I was so excited because how many times does a college start a new program and ask mm -hmm. somebody to write the curriculum? And it doesn't matter what industry we're talking about. Yeah, and it's your passion too, right? right like this right. is, you're well, invested in it yeah, already. And, and I think I mentioned to you about P.O. Ackley and that you know he, in his career he did certain things. One of them mm -hmm. was teaching at the college in Trinidad. and. I thought, how much fun is that, that I get to repeat <laughs> what he did mm -hmm. 70 years later or whatever, you know? Yeah. So I got to start a program at Flathead Valley Community College. It's still ongoing. Mm -hmm. I've since passed the baton to some other people, and they're teaching the program, and I'm just an advisor now. I just yeah. hang on to make sure the decisions they make carry them in a good direction. Yep. You know? Um, and actually, I know a lot of you are interested in gunsmithing for either yourself or to contemplate that as a career. If you click on that first link in the video description, in the article we'll put some links to some of these schools, the resources, and some of the stuff that we're showing as well, just Good. as a side note. Yeah. Yeah. So once I wrote the program, mm -hmm. then we went through the process of getting it authorized and started teaching. Uh, the first couple of years we had fairly limited number of students, which in a way was good because it gave us a chance to wring out the shortcoming of the program and, and improve it. Um, and now it's become pretty successful. They have a, a good attendance every year. Good. And uh, we're not quite to a waiting list, but it's getting there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. We need to keep this heritage alive. We need to pass these skills on from generation to generation. And yes, things are evolving, but there's just so much to share that is timeless, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's quite a legacy. I appreciate you sharing all that. Well, thank you. Next, let's talk about some of these other characters. I think we can agree the gunsmithing community is an eccentric bunch. Absolutely. Including you and me. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. <laughs> I've never tried to claim that I'm normal. <laughs> right. You know? In fact, I consider normal kind of a negative. Yeah, it's a little boring, I think. Right. Can be. Yeah, I mean, I, I, a lot of the work I do is tedious and boring mm -hmm. because that's just the nature of running a business. Mm -hmm. But um, the reason I went into gunsmithing in a large part was because every day is different. Mm -hmm. Um, even if I'm working on the same project, the problem the next day is always sure. different from the day before. Yep. Um, it's just the nature of working through a project. Yeah. So um, tell me about some of the people that you've run across in your career and running your business. These. Yeah, one of the first ones I remember is one of the first guys I worked for. Um, and um, his, his approach to business was very different from most people's. He'd been in business a long time. Mm -hmm. he, he and his partner at one time had managed um, the Hollywood Gun Shop, which is where Hollywood Reloading Tools came from. Okay, and all that. yep. And um, so they had exposure to some, some famous people and mm -hmm. some, some un unique situations business-wise. Mm -hmm. And one of them was um, Hollywood Gun Shop was eventually sold to a group in, of investors. And so to manufacture uh, reloading tools, you know, you need to have some capital to make a run of 100 or 200 sure. or whatever the deal is. Yep. And of course, their tools were expensive. At the, in the 60s, their turret loading press was like $1,200. So what? that was, yeah. <laughs> so that's like for the average guy back that's then. That's a Volkswagen bug, basically. Right. Maybe t 
eighteen hundred two grand at right. that point. Yeah. Well, I know I know my dad's income around that time. He worked for the government as a as a meteorologist, and his <laughs> income at that time was like thirty two or thirty six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're talking about four to six months of income for the average person mm -hmm. for a reloading press. Right. You know. So they were premium. They were they were the Cadillac at the mm -hmm. time. Anyway, when they were bought out by the investment group, they came to this guy's name was Wayne Stevens, and they came to him and they said. Um, we've got like 90 orders on the books, what do we do? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you guys need to fund a uh, production cycle. Well, how much is that? And he gave them a number. And they said, geez, that's a lot of money. And he goes, yeah, but these are sold. We'll have a few on the shelf, mm -hmm. and then we'll just do another round. You mm -hmm. know? So he convinced them to give them the money. They made the production run, delivered the ones that were already sold, and they had about 10 left. Well, by the time the production run, run was finished, he sold the other 10. And they came back and they said, what'd you do with the 10 that were on the shelf? And he says, I sold them. Damn it, now we're going to have to make more. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I just, wow. stood there, I just stood there and shook my head. I said, that's, and, and the reason was the investors were doctors, lawyers, uh, accountants. Mm -hmm. They were all people who don't produce a physical product. Sure, they don't understand So they that. couldn't understand, you know, intellectually the idea mm -hmm. of building something and then putting it on the shelf for, for sale. And he had the same problem with, um, inventory and stuff. And he said yeah. one of the things he would do is the suppliers would call him and say, hey, we can't ship to you because you guys are overdue paying your bill. And of course, that's the investor group trying to hold mm -hmm. money. Mm -hmm. So he said, well, I'll tell you what, can you ship to me COD? They'd say, sure. He said, okay, well, add a few boxes of ammo to each order so that I can pay you and I'll just overpay on the COD. So he would pay them an extra hundred bucks on each COD and hmm. they'd do that three, four times a week and he'd gradually pay off the bill. And he said the accountant would come to him after he figured out what was going on, and he'd go, what are you doing paying the bills off? <laughs> you know, and he's going, guys, we can't stay open if we don't pay our bills. Yeah. You know, and, but somehow they had it in their mind that the business just had to have the doors open and it would generate money. You know, so. It's funny the example you use, because as many of you have seen, I've featured the Area 4190 press, which is a turret. Right. Which costs $1,200. Right. And now you look at the Hollywood press costing about that back in the 60s, it's a totally different right. scale of investment, right. even at that. Well, yeah, that $1,200 now is a, is a much, much smaller percentage sure. of your annual income. It's not even a premium optic for your rifle, right? right. Yeah, right. That's, an interesting, that's an interesting one. So tell me about some more of these people that you've run into. Um, so the guy who ran the gunsmithing school I went to, Bob yep. Dunlap, yep. Um, he, you have to understand from a teacher's point of view once you get the program down and you know what you're teaching every year and it repeats over and over again, then you have to start looking for ways to entertain yourself <laughs> while you're educating. <laughs> and Bob was really good at entertaining himself. <laughs> um, <laughs> one thing that he did to almost every student, and this was actually a teaching thing as well as a practical joke. Yeah. He, he ran a repair business at his own shop outside of the school hours. Mm -hmm. So he would put his pockets full of used gun parts mm -hmm. And he'd walk around the shop while guys were disassembling and reassembling. Oh, no, I know and where this is going. as soon as you turned your head, he'd <laughs> flick a part on your bench. <laughs> and uh, my favorite thing was, I, I was aware that he did this, and he hadn't done it to me most of the time I was there. One day I put this gun together, and here's this part that doesn't match. <laughs> and I knew it didn't fit the gun. Yeah. So I took the gun to Bob to be checked. You, you, you get points. like It's like being paid money. Gotcha. So you get points for each thing you finish. Mm -hmm. And Bob's looking the gun over, and he knew what I did to fix it, and he knew what I was getting points for. And he just keeps rolling it over and looking at it, and he keeps opening the action and looking inside, and turning it over. And I just let him do that as long as he wanted to do it. <laughs> and finally, he kind of looks at me, and he goes, did you have any problems? And I said, no, because I didn't put this in it. Nice. And he laughed. He, you know, he loved yeah. being caught. That's funny. Yeah. The other thing he would do is, is Bob... Um, had arthritis and he had also had uh, a minor birth defect when he grew when mm -hmm. he was born and um, his knuckles looked just like anybody else's knuckles but his fingers went off kind of at an angle mm -hmm. so he could do things uh, dexterity wise that you can't do and I can't do yeah and it was an, an adaptation of how those fingers sure angled like Jerry Garcia you know the Grateful Dead yeah one of his fingers was chopped off oh, wow. by an axe as a child and that was Created his guitar picking technique. Oh, no one else. It. No one else can really do that the same. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how th things can become an advantage. Sure. Right? Yeah, yeah. So he um, uh, would love to do these practical joke things. You know, you bring a gun to be checked. I remember taking a 1911 to him, 
and the the test was it had to feed an empty round mm -hmm. from the magazine mm -hmm. and um, so you're just supposed to put it in the magazine drop the slide and it should feed home smoothly mm -hmm. and uh, so I bring him the gun and I know it's working perfectly at my bench because I'm mm -hmm. trying to get this done so I can move on to the next project and uh, Bob takes the gun from me and he's kind of holding it close to his chest so I knew something was probably up you know but he's, <laughs> he's acting like he's just looking at it yeah and uh, he drops the slide and and sure enough it sticks and I said try one more time Bob so he puts it back in and mm -hmm. starts over he drops the magazine and it sticks I said take your fat thumb off the back of my yeah, slide dragging it <laughs> <laughs> and he goes he <laughs> you know he, he had a funny little <laughs> chuckle that um, and then I, one of my things getting even with him was we had um, a class where what he'd do is when he'd go in the classroom, they had these chalkboards, you know, old mm -hmm. school kind of place. And he'd hide chalk on the top of the chalkboard because uh, the other people who used that classroom would take it all with them for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So we walk in one day and I, and I got there before him and the other students are sitting around. And, and you know those uh, little snap cap things that you mm -hmm. throw and they mm -hmm. explode? Mm -hmm. So I handed those out to everybody in the class and <laughs> I said, when Bob turns his back to write <laughs> to draw a picture, <laughs> let him have it. Yeah. So he turns around and he's going like this, reaching for chalk. And, mm -hmm. -ow, you know, and, he, nice. and he's jumping up and down and dancing, which was hilarious because he's, he's <laughs> not exactly the uh, most... Uh, not very athletic? Yeah, yeah no, not <laughs> okay. at all. Not even a little. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he turns around and, and, of course, as soon as the fear thing goes mm -hmm. away, which is mm -hmm. pretty instantaneous, he goes, I want to see one of those. Because <laughs> he had to figure out how it blew up. And, you know, yeah, yeah. The funny. curiosity level came on him instantly. Yeah. You know, so... So he was a lot of fun because he could give a joke and he mm -hmm. could take a joke. Um, he also believed that everything in the gun business was free knowledge. Mm -hmm. There's no secrets. And this is, you asked me about different kinds of personalities. Yeah, yeah. The secret keeper versus the instructor would be... Right. And, and, and Bob spectrum. was the, all knowledge is free and for your taking. Mm -hmm. And the more interest you showed in his class, the more interest you showed in uh, the project at hand, the more mm -hmm. he would give you. Yeah. Which, you know, I mean, I tell you these funny stories about him. That's the, the really important part is that he had no problem stopping and answering questions. Mm -hmm. He loved it when you came to him and said, Bob, I've got this problem and I think this is the solution. If you came to him and said, how do I do this? Mm -hmm. He might walk away from you. <laughs> right. 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 And I've seen other instructors do that. And it's... Which is the key skill you need as a gunsmith, right? You don't need to know how to do everything. You need to know how to troubleshoot. Problem solve, identify mm -hmm. problems, and learn, right? right? Constantly learning. Right. And, and that was Bob's teaching method was to help you become an, an analyst. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at these parts, you know which ones do which job. Mm -hmm. So identify those first. And anything you don't know, you can fill in the blanks because I know this is the trigger, this is the hammer, here's the sear mechanism, whatever that might be. Yeah. Uh, shell latches or whatever. You yep. identify all that stuff and anything in between explains itself. So it's, you, you can take apart a gun you've never seen in your life, and mm -hmm. with that methodology, you can figure it out. Yep. You know, um, it's, and at working as a gunsmith, it was always hard for me when somebody would say, have you ever worked on one of these? Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I, I don't care. Yeah, you know? I'll, I'll figure it out. I right. think that philosophy that Bob Dunlap had is so important to us, ensuring that this whole craft, this whole profession goes and, and doesn't just die off because mm -hmm. a lot of the old gunsmiths are literally dying mm -hmm. and they're taking a lot of knowledge with them to the grave. You know, so part of what I enjoy about what I do here on the channel is I get to share some of that and I get to people, get people excited about it and hopefully empower you all to know you can build your own rifle and then build your own ammo and then shoot it, right? Right. Which was my dream. A small subset of the whole gunsmithing picture. And sure, I'll do more stuff, but you know, that's kind of my thing. Mm -hmm. And so to, I think we should be advocating that people learn as much as they can and, you know, to pursue this either as a hobby or as a profession. So right. if we hold it too tightly, then, then it could end up be hurting the community in right. the long run. Right. And, it, you know, it, the whole idea of whether it's secret knowledge or not is interesting mm -hmm. to me because um, basically if you were to meet 10 gunsmiths over a period of time and they mm -hmm. shared one little secret with you, whatever it was, and then you continued to meet new gunsmiths, you would find out that those little secrets were common knowledge somewhere yes. else. Right. 
So that's why I have a problem with trying to keep it a secret. I, yeah. I really feel you're doing a disservice to the client. You're doing a disservice to the shooting public. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you know, we're, we're in kind of a dying trade in a way. I mean, sure. The, the whole, I don't have a problem with AR-15s. I actually ha have a few and I like them and they're fun and they have a purpose. But um, as a gunsmith, they're boring. Because <laughs> it's basically Barbie doll for men. <laughs> well, wait till you see what Gordy and I have planned. I know, you're going to do something <laughs> super accurate. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's fun because you're taking a platform into territory where it's not known for being. I don't think you're really building a rifle. I'm sorry to offend some of you if I do here. <laughs> you're not really building a rifle unless there's chips flying and you're altering the metal, right? You're assembling. Right. And that's great and it's fun, but it's not really the same as building a rifle. Right, which is exactly why I call it Barbie dolls. <laughs> right. It, it just snaps together. It's yeah. kind of like Legos, you know. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, we've purposely done classes at Flathead Valley f mm -hmm. for the AR, and it's kind of amusing because the kids, and I shouldn't say kids because most of them are mm -hmm. pretty good adults, but the guys who've never been exposed to gunsmithing and never been exposed to um, AR platform, mm -hmm. they enjoy the heck out of it. They, mm -hmm. they love every minute of it because it is, it is a skill and it is something to learn. Yeah. But it's funny because we have a lot of veterans. Mm -hmm. And the veterans are going, can we please move on? <laughs> oh, really? It's not like I haven't <laughs> seen these before. Right. right. You know, and obviously they're different than the military version. But, sure. But the only thing different is the sear mechanism and, and mm -hmm. the safety mechanism. I mean, they're, they're the same gun. Sure. And, uh, you know, politically maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but, but it's the reality <laughs> of what the gun is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's fun to, to hear those reactions. You know, the young guy yeah. who's just, just enjoying the heck out of it, and then the yep. veteran who's going... Can we please, mm -hmm. you know? And we required it because it was one of those things. I got I got uh, the guys at Brownells to come teach the class. Oh, awesome. So they did that for free, which mm -hmm. is great for the students. And yeah. it became that piece of curriculum instead of me teaching ARs, which I have to do as part of the deal. Yeah. I let a third party come in, give a different mm -hmm. kind of presentation. He's a specialist. He has all the tools. Yep. You know, so they get a huge benefit from it, even if they... Maybe Definitely don't recognize it. No, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I, if you happen to be a gunsmith with a lot of knowledge, think about who you could transfer that knowledge to. Think yeah. about who you could inspire to empower to work on their own guns or to make a profession out of it. Next, well, so we talked about the people. Right. Next, we're going to talk about some of the tools and the tales they tell. So what we have here is a small subset of all the tools that you'll find at 40 Rim Rentals, which is 40rentals.com. Correct. Tell us at, at a high level, let's step back for a moment, what are all the different categories of, of gunsmithing tools that you rent? Okay, so the the one thing about 4drentals.com is, is that you have to have stuff small enough to conveniently mail to people. So, sure. So we don't do things like uh, barrel vices or action wrenches bis mm -hmm. because they're basically just too heavy to ship at, at gotcha. an economic rate. Yep. So the core material that we do is chamber reamers and headspace gauges. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of fun because sometimes people think we only have one of something, you know, so they'll, mm -hmm. do you have one available for me? Well, <laughs> it's like aspirin in a drugstore. <laughs> I have 20 of those, and yes, we yep. can fill your order. And so you probably have some sort of a bell curve, I imagine, of the most popular cartridges have the most number of reamers and gauges associated with them in your inventory or whatever. Right. Yeah. And that kind of slides around when something new comes along, 6.5 TRC, 300 PRC, mm -hmm. completely change the look of that curve. Yeah. You know, um, the most recent thing is probably the 6 ARC. Mm -hmm. um, and it hasn't taken off quite like the others, and I think it's just because of the availability of brass right now. Yeah, the availability mm -hmm. of just about everything right. for components, it's, it's totally ridiculous. A lot of me, people are telling me, why should I look at reloading content when I can't get primers? <laughs> you know, and they, things move along, you know, but we're all feeling the pain, right? <laughs> right, right. And the, the, the producers are cranking it out as fast as they can. It's yep. just a question of getting it through the pipeline. Yep. Um, I just noticed this week that the pipeline's filling up a little bit. I, some of the places that I look for things, mm -hmm. I'm seeing guns and ammunition where a month ago I didn't. So, that's good. So that's a nice change. Um, but anyway, about the reamers, um, if it's a standard factory caliber, SAMI caliber or CIP mm -hmm. caliber, mm -hmm. we probably have multiples. In most cases, we have large numbers of multiples. If it's an esoteric cartridge, like a black powder cartridge or something mm -hmm. like that, then we, we may only have one or two. Mm -hmm. um, 
But the goal is to have enough so that the, the back orders are minimized. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that I expand the inventory is we watch back orders and anytime something starts to move in that direction, we buy more tools. Which is great because right. there's two, two parts of the whole Reamer rental thing to me. One is, yes, you're going to save money and if it's a one-off job, definitely look at that. But also, if you look at buying Reamers, the wait time can be completely insane. So you're solving yeah. really two problems right? as I see it. Yeah, and actually that's you know one of the ways that I advertise the business now is save time. Mm -hmm. I don't worry so much about the money part of it because time is a bigger issue at this point. It really is. And yeah. um, you know, I mean, my suppliers, I don't get tools any faster than, than Joe down the street does. Mm -hmm. And so to wait 12 weeks or more for a reamer is not unusual. Yep. And that's a little hard sometimes for people who aren't in the gun trade as a business. They're doing it for a hobby or maybe they're just getting started. Mm -hmm. They haven't learned yet that the gun business has traditionally always had long waits. Mm -hmm. And now it's even worse because there's so much more demand. Yeah. Um, and the, you know, the suppliers, I think, are trying to ma maximize their production as much as they can. But they have to guess, too, which cartridges do I need to build tools for to keep mm -hmm. the pipeline full yep. and they don't always guess right you know so mm -hmm. that's why we have have long delivery times yeah um, I send stuff in for resharpening I don't do resharpening in-house mm -hmm. um, the only thing we do is clean off metal buildup or mm -hmm. or chip welding where it's yep. chip welded on the shoulder um, and really you can a lot of times you can pop that off with a penny I think it, we've talked about that what is it though older than 1982 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it needs to be a copper penny, yeah. not, not the new zinc coated with mm -hmm. copper type thing. Mm -hmm. And um, you just take that penny. I, a lot of times I'll grab it in a pair of pliers so that I can get a good grip on it. Oh, nice. Yeah. And, um, and, then, and then also maybe put the shank of the uh, reamer in a vise or something mm -hmm. so that you can actually push. Mm -hmm. And of course you don't want to cut yourself, but basically yeah. you're, you can use that copper to push the little chip off. Mm -hmm. And what's nice about that is the copper is a little bit, when it comes to cutting in a chamber, it's lubrous. So it helps hmm. um, with chip flow and minimizes that welding in the future. Gotcha. Uh, Leaves a little deposit right there on the leading right. edge. And sometimes you can see it, you know, when you're mm -hmm. scraping that stuff off. Mm -hmm. you're, you're not really working directly on the cutting edge. You're in, inside the flute and pushing that mm -hmm. stuff off. And you can sometimes see a little copper left behind and that's, that's not a bad thing. It's mm -hmm. actually good for the reamer. Mm -hmm especially if you're doing stainless steel. Stainless and copper work well, real well together. Yeah, I so. did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah, actually when you manufacture barrels, um, you use copper sulfate before you push the button through or pull mm -hmm. the button through, mm -hmm. and that provides a fair amount of lubricity for that button to ride on. Yeah. So it's, uh, it works out well. Cool. So what else do we have here? Um, we have, uh, this is a um, device for um, lapping your bolt lugs. Mm -hmm. So you remove the barrel, thread this into the receiver, mm -hmm. and then this is a spring-loaded plunger, which has got a pretty good force on it. Yeah. And the idea is this just rides on the bolt face and provides mechanical push against yeah. the bolt. Yeah, so you don't have to pull back right. like you normally and, do. Well, and, and that's just it. I've seen a lot of guys uh, doing YouTube videos where mm -hmm. they're holding that bolt back and mm -hmm. trying to work it. This makes it a lot easier. You're just sure. working the bolt up and down. Uh, it doesn't put any undue wear on the muzzle or on the on the breech face, mm -hmm. um, and you just want to keep it clean. You don't want to put any of the lapping compound on that face. You're just putting it on the lugs. Who makes this particular tool? That particular one is a PTG. Uh, mm -hmm. They make a few different ones, and mm -hmm. um, what I started doing is I make some of them in my own shop because I want models that maybe aren't available or I couldn't get. Yeah, there's different tenon diameters and threadings and all that. Right, and, you know. so I have several that I made. Um, and they're exactly the same type of tool. A lot of mine are made from pieces of barrel shank. Cause sure. Over the years, I've done so many barrels I can't count. But yeah. Um, so that's a really simple tool. Um, the, the you asked about kind of the funny stories that come from those. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. seen those come back where it was obvious that the person using it didn't know how it was supposed to work. <laughs> yeah. And they had <laughs> lapped the face a whole bunch, and um, I've seen them where. <laughs> I'm not sure what they had them screwed against, but the, there's a <laughs> ring left on the face of the lapping wow. deal. So um, <laughs> people are creative. If they don't really understand <laughs> the mechanics of a tool, they'll do things with it that really it was never <laughs> intended for. So, um, and then we have a reamer holder here. This happens to be a Dave Manson. Floater. Yep. And um, so the advantage to this one is it's very simple. There's no ball bearings or hydraulics or anything. So it holds up really well to the rental process. Mm -hmm. Uh, it provides just a little bit of axial movement 
uh, more than enough for, you know, most guys have a lathe that um, they think is pretty accurate and they've dialed in their tail stock pretty nice. What they may not realize, and Gordy teaches this, that the, the tail stock uh, can move up and down when you, mm -hmm. when you lock it down in place. Yeah. So one of the things that's nice about a floating reamer holder is that it takes up anything you missed in your setup. Sure. You know, and there's two approaches, of course. You can try and control every aspect when you're doing your chambering, mm -hmm. or you can allow certain tools to fix problems maybe you're not aware of. Just like with reloading, right? Sure. Floating dies and floating shell holders and all yep. that kind of stuff. And that's, yeah. always, that's always been my approach personally, is, mm -hmm. I, is I try to use tools that will fix problems that I don't want to take the time to fix. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, to me it's very cost effective. Yeah, and it all it. depends on your goals, obviously. Sure. When you get to that bench rest level, you might want to go that extra and, mile. And yeah. then it is absolutely necessary and worthwhile to dig mm -hmm. into those little details and fix them. Mm -hmm. um, what I tell gunsmiths when I'm teaching is, if you do that work, if somebody comes to you and wants that process, charge for that work. It has value. Mm -hmm. And one of the mistakes people make as a gunsmith, I think, is leaving money on the table. Yeah. Um, and they're worried about losing the job. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be worried about that because your reputation's at stake. Yeah. And if, if you do a lesser job and charge less money, you're just starving yourself to death and ultimately it comes across that maybe you don't know how to do the better work. Sure. So uh, in my experience, you're better off to do premium quality work and charge every penny for it. Yes. You know, and the, the advantage there is your reputation grows mm -hmm. because the customer says, yeah, he wasn't cheap, but everything he did for me was perfect. Yep. You know. And, and if you're honest and if you advocate work that's going to help that customer's goals come true, you know, then mm -hmm. it's good for both parties. Well, and of course, you know, the, the build we're going to do, it'll be in another video, right? Yes. But Click subscribe with notifications. There's a follow on to this video you're not going to want to miss. Right. <laughs> and the, and that, that video is going to be about the guy who can't afford every fancy tool yep. and, and wants to do a nice build but not spend a fortune on setup and tooling and equipment. Yep. Um, and so that's part of the reason some of these tools I brought is because they're the kind of things a guy can do in his garage or on the kitchen table. You know. Yeah, let's talk about this guy. Yeah, so these are annular cutters and an annular cutter uh, in the machine world is for mag drills where you clamp a mag dr mm -hmm. drill down on a piece of plate or on a block or something and you cut a precise hole at a precise location. I would love to have one of those. Right. They're, they're very cool. <laughs> um, so that's what these are. They're actually from that system. Mm -hmm. They have a hole that goes all the way through them for a pilot. And um, what happened here is, and I didn't invent this. This is mm -hmm. something somebody else thought about and did. Mm -hmm. They figured out which of these have the correct diameters so that you can do muzzle threading. Mm -hmm. And so that what you do is instead of having a lathe, you use this to reduce the diameter of your muzzle. The inside has a fixed size and, and you just cut whatever excess material you have off using the face yeah. of the cutter. Yep. So, so it cuts the shoulder and it cuts the diameter down. Exactly. With the different cutting flutes there. Right. And so basically when you push the pilot through, you have a little stub comes out the back. Mm -hmm. And that's, most guys use this to drive it. They're going to they're gonna um, use a, a cordless drill, variable speed yep. drill. It's real important to keep the RPMs low on these. Mm -hmm. It's funny, when I first got them, people were burning them up pretty frequently. So I sat down and I read a whole, wrote a whole new set of instructions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did was I stuck warning, warning, warning <laughs> across the page. And basically that warning just tells them um, to slow down, mm -hmm. use oil, mm -hmm. and, and keep it under 250 RPMs. Since I wrote that, I've had almost none of them come back nice. damaged. So. No bright blue uh, <laughs> heat <And> discoloration. That, <laughs> if they don't use oil, that happens. Oh and, boy. and I sometimes get pilots back that I'm very concerned that the customer maybe needs to check their bore. Sure. Because there's enough damage to this Oof. pilot that I'm like, you got a chip stuck, you did something. Yeah. You know, and, and this that brings up an interesting point. People um, sometimes don't understand that pilots are supposed to be slip fit. Mm -hmm. They should never bind. Mm -hmm. They should never be hard to put in or take out. Right. And we see a lot of damage to pilots that it was clear that the person didn't look at that aspect. Sure. You know, well, I managed to get it in the muzzle, so now I'll just jam it home. <laughs> um, yeah, and w what I do is I put it on a range rod or something like that, mm -hmm. and I'll insert it in, you know, and then I'll go a ways in because sometimes things get a little tighter the further right. you get in there, depending on how it's lapped or if it's lapped, you know. Mm -hmm. And you want a tight enough fit that there's not excess slop. 
but right. you don't want it to be so tight that it's in there dragging and right. scratching and, and, and all the rest. Right. Yeah. And on the, on the pilot subject, I brought this to show you. Is this is a pilot from a standard reamer that somebody mm -hmm. forced, and they managed to cut part of the pilot away using that 90 degree shoulder where the pilot yeah. matches up and pushed it right over the forcing cone. Oof. And then they also managed to jam the screw in the front so that it's almost <laughs> welded in place. Wow. And the way I found this, of course, is when I go to clean the reamers and take the chip weld off or yep. whatever, I touched it when I was going to take it off, and I could feel the large spots and the burrs <laughs> on it. So um, that's probably something you in B-roll want to show them up close. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit painful, but that's reality. <laughs> right. <laughs> but luckily, that's fairly small percentage of the stuff I get back from people. Mm -hmm. Most people are super respectful of the rental tools, realizing that if they want to rent again in the future, Mm -hmm. If they return stuff in good condition and clean, that mm -hmm. keeps the costs down, and I'm going to be there to help them in the future. Yeah. So um, these these instances are rare, and we watch for them. There, you'll see inspection stickers on our shipping tubes and stuff. Mm -hmm. That's legit. We have a, a lit magnifying system, and it's not really powerful. It's like two power. Okay. But that's enough to see things that would make the reamer or whatever cutter unserviceable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's something that can be fixed in house, we fix it. But yeah. most most anything that's really damaged goes to Pacific Tool and Gauge to be mm -hmm. recut. Um, and the reason I do that is it's it's reliable. I know what I'm going to get back from them. Mm -hmm. uh, I know what the time frame is going to be. Costs are set. Yep. You know, so that and they, they know their tooling. They know what all the relief angles need to be and right. all that stuff, right? And yeah. and we're down to the point where you know after like 16 years of running a rental business, I have very set, simple policies that are easy for the customer mm -hmm. to follow. Um, if people don't follow them, it's simply because just I'm just like everybody else. When I'm on a website and I have to click a box to finish the order, mm -hmm. I don't read any of that stuff. <laughs> right. And I know they don't read it on my site. <laughs> right. But but it's the reality, you know. Um, I like to be very responsible. You know, it used to be the people in the gun industry were all personal responsibility oriented. Mm -hmm. they, um, they didn't want to do anything that would hinder business for anybody else. Mm -hmm. They wanted to pay their own bills, pay their own way. Yep. In the last 15 years or so, with the major expansion of the gun business, we've brought in a lot of people from outside the industry that don't have that ethic. Mm -hmm. And I'm I've heard stories. I'm, yeah, and yeah. I'm, I'm seeing it in the <laughs> rental business. There are more people who are both lacking in knowledge of how to use the tool mm -hmm. and don't have personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and that adds a huge expense to the business. but. I've still managed to keep that to a level by adding training and adding books. And mm -hmm. um, one of the things I do is the, um, and we'll give you a link for this. Mm -hmm. I have a copy of the primer, which teaches how tools work and why they're designed the way they are. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really teach gunsmithing per se. It just teaches a lot about how the tools are supposed to function. Yeah, I, I read that copy that you gave me. Great. Right. It's a quick read too. You could read this in an hour. But I'm going to give you a link where they can get it for free. Oh, nice. Yeah. Perfect. Another reason to click on that first link in the video description. Right. <laughs> so um, the other tools that are here, we've got uh, in, in use with the muzzle, uh, the, the annular cutter, I brought a die so we'll be able to mm -hmm. thread the muzzle, uh, brought a suppressor for the gun we're going to be building. Mm -hmm. And um, so we'll use those tools just to show that that stuff can be done without a lathe mm -hmm. and can be done precisely. Yep. Um, the other thing I brought was a crowning tool. This is also a tool, but Brownells sells these. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like their standard set. It has a pilot that goes uh, on the various tools so yep. you can align it and keep it straight to your gun. Uh, there's an 11 degree target cutter. There's a 90 degree facer if you needed to cut the barrel off and face it back. Yep. Uh, there's a 45 degree cutter. People use these for a lot of different purposes. Hmm. Um, one of the purposes is if you do the 11 degree crown, you can take this and use it sort of as a deburring tool. You make yeah. a very light cut and just basically take the crowns off the rifling right sure. at the muzzle yep. and just remove any little burr there might be at the bottom of the groove. Yeah. Um, and a lot of guys use them for that specific purpose. But I've seen them used for, um, oh, beveling the back of a cylinder so that you can load faster, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there, those are some of the tools we brought along so that we could really wanted to show that there's a lot of things you can do without yeah. specialty lathe or a mill or whatever. Um, some of the other things we've got, a uh, this is a PTG product, they call it their Ackley Reamer Stop. Hmm. And basically you can put this in a floating holder, you can run it in the tailstock, 
and um, half inch shank just like the uh, Manson holder there. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did the half inch shank on both of them is because um, you can run that in a chuck in the tailstock and you don't have to have the exact taper. Yeah, Morse taper three versus four, whatever it happens to be on that lathe. Yeah. Right, so that saves me a lot of money on mm -hmm. inventory. I can mm -hmm. have a half a dozen of these and not have to worry about which taper it is. Yeah. So um, these are a micrometer adjustable. They've got markings on the shaft. Mm -hmm. So you put the reamer in, you can, usually what I do is I establish how, where the headspace is gonna be and I cut to within 20 thousandths or so. Mm -hmm. And then I use this to set the final distance. Gotcha. And it's really, it's really fast because you can do that roughing, essentially roughing the chamber even with a finish reamer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, just when you get to the tiny little bit at the end, you take your final measurement and you say, okay, I need 15 thousandths and you run this up to the back of the, or, or run it up so you know where you're at. And it basically yep. comes to the back of the barrel usually. Yep. And then you just dial it off the amount you need to get the proper head space. I love that because it gives you that confidence, right? The last 20 thousandths is that critical range where it's so easy to overshoot. Right, and that's the point where um, I think a new customer or a, a, you know somebody beginning in gunsmithing is so scared because mm -hmm. here I've got this three or $500 barrel blank in the lathe and mm -hmm. if I overshoot this, I have to set the barrel back. And, right. and, and it's funny to me too that new gunsmiths oftentimes are like, uh, I had to set the barrel back, it was a big deal. And I'm like, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years, I know for a fact that setting the barrel back is <laughs> not a big deal. Right, you especially know. if you only need to go 10 thou, because all that is is a shoulder cut, right? right? It's kind of like when you're clocking, if you want the barrel to be pointing up or down or right. whatever that happens to be. Yeah, that's a quick measurement and a yep. little bit of facing. Yeah, okay, so. so that's the tools. Next, we're gonna do a brief overview of the books. So I've already published an in-depth Fred Zeglin gunsmithing books article, which I will point you all to, but w let's give a quick recap. Tell me about the collection of books that you've written. Um, well, I'll kind of do it chronologically, I guess. Kay. Yeah. So the first book is the, the uh, Red Wildcat book, and it, it's Wildcats, um, and then I think the subtitle is Handbook for uh, Reloaders and something else. I don't, sadly, it's been, you know, 15 plus years since I wrote it, so my memory's <laughs> not so great. Um, in fact, it's due for a second edition. Gotcha. I'm, I'm in the process mm -hmm. of starting to research for a second edition. That'll mm -hmm. probably take about a year. Mm -hmm. But um, that book, I actually wrote that as a result of teaching the Wildcat classes for the NRA. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, gee, I've already got the outline written, so how long could it take to write the book? Mm -hmm. Now tell yeah. me, uh, okay, I said we're going to do an <laughs> overview, but let's dig into this just a little bit. I know wildcatting involves necking down, mm -hmm. necking up, right, and all of the other ballistics and reloading aspects. Right. What else is there to it? So the first thing I did was I defined what is a wildcat. Okay. And, yep. and naturally there's some opinion there. Not everybody is uh, going to believe what I believe. Okay. But my thing is if it's an improved cartridge like Ackley did where you're just blowing out the shoulder. Yeah. Technically, that's a Wildcat, but to me, that's just an improved cartridge. So I consider that the entry-level Wildcat. And, gotcha. and I call them improved just like that. It's did. like a tweak. Right, because you can way. still fire factory ammunition in that type of chamber. Yep. So that's not a true Wildcat in my view. Okay. A true Wildcat requires cold forming of the brass in some way. Okay. Or shortening or lengthening. You know, in other words, having some basic brass you can work yep. from. Um, but it requires some kind of mechanical work on the brass before mm -hmm. you can have cartridges you can fire. There's no commercial source initially. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You might have a boutique house that makes ammo yep. or brass for you, but that's after the fact and it's yep. all complete. Let's use, six, let's use the Creedmoors as an example. Mm -hmm. Let's pretend that 22 Creedmoor brass didn't exist. That's mm -hmm. a wildcat. Um, You're necking it down? So let's, let's, let's say you started from, what, three, oh, was it 308 is well, the Well, let's say you started head? with 65 Creedmoor. Right. So there's two, if you necked it up to seven, that's one scenario, mm -hmm. if you necked it down to 22. And that's really the very simplest way to yep. wildcat because now you're not forming the shoulder or changing headspace. Right. You're yep. simply changing the neck diameter so you have to take into consideration the neck and throat. Yep. So the easiest way to do those kind of wildcats, and it's something that I sometimes suggest to customers at 4D, is you can use a body reamer, put the correct mm -hmm. pilot on it for the bore, Mm -hmm. as long as you're going up in diameter. Yep. Because then you can take a neck and throat reamer and follow up and cut Pop your... Pop it up. Just to whatever... You just need to know your specs sure. so that you can run the neck and throat to the correct length. Yep, that makes sense. Right. And yep. that, that is absolutely the very simplest form of wildcatting because mm -hmm. you're 
not changing headspace. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, really easy to form that brass. You just put an expander ball in that's appropriate to the yep. brass, and away you go. Yeah. Um, my first experience with that was when I was in gunsmithing school. My first reloading project, you had to do 100 rounds of ammunition uh, to show that you had learned how to reload. Mm -hmm. And um, so I did 30-06 was my initial load. And then the first gun I built after that was a 25-06. So then I learned how to size mm -hmm. that down. And it was surprising to me how easy it is. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a lot of people try to make a big thing about forming brass. And, mm -hmm. and real, I realized that 30 to 25 is not a big deal. But I had, I had to been told horror stories from other reloaders. Sure. And believed them. Yeah. You know, the truth is reloading is pretty simple. And as long yeah. as you're willing to pay attention to details... Yep. Wildcatting is a lot of fun and it's really not that hard. Gotcha. Okay. So thank you for that deep dive. I, okay. I'm going to uh, read that book. Okay. And uh, after the wildcatting book, let's continue through the chronology. Right. So the, the, um, the next thing I did was I said, well, gee, I've been gathering all this information. I probably could do another book. And my thought initially was I want to do something on uh, a whole bunch of gunsmiths of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the, the Petrov books hadn't been done yet or anything, so hmm. I wasn't going over somebody else's material. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started doing research, and it came, it very quickly it came to my attention that even though I knew names of a bunch of gunsmiths that I thought were appropriate, mm -hmm. there wasn't very much detail that I could come up with. Mm -hmm. Well, in the process, P.O. Ackley stuff, I already had gathered a ton of information doing the Wildcat book. Gotcha. Yep. And I said, well, now it's obvious to me that I can do a book about P.O. Ackley and I can locate information that's worthwhile and, and yeah. will tell a new story. Gotcha. I had no desire to um, reprint P.O. Ackley's uh, books and, and not add something new. Mm -hmm. um, if I was going to do his story, I wanted to add material that frankly is not out there. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like I did a really good job of that. You asked me earlier what I'm proud of, I'm really proud of that book. Mm -hmm. And um, truthfully, of the books that I have, I probably made the least money on that book. Mm -hmm. um, published it through Gun Digest, so the arrangement you make with a big publisher is always different than sure. the other yeah. things they you Yeah, they have do. to make money, and you have to make money. And right, yeah. and, and I felt that book deserved to be with a big publisher because mm -hmm. it tells a story that um, hasn't been told elsewhere, and it needed to be a nice book with a nice mm -hmm. cover. And, um, but it, uh, it covers him from, basically from birth to death. Oh, wow. And the, the goal wasn't to tell his life story personally, but to tell his gunsmithing life story. Yeah. And so I go through everything. You know, there's a little bit of family history there to tell the story about where he comes from. Sure. And then um, where he went to school and how that all went and why that made a difference to his career. Mm -hmm. And then we go through and we follow him. Uh, it's kind of broken down by where he lived because those became chapters in his life and they're natural mm -hmm. chapters in the book. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Belm was the guy who bought him out last, bought his business and bought all his equipment. Hmm. And uh, I had interviewed him a couple times for the book and he came to me when I sent him his proof copy. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, he said, I always wondered how you were going to make this a book because it's so spread all over the place and little yeah. bits of information. Right. And he said, I'm really impressed that you managed to collate that stuff in a way that tells a real story. Yeah. And um, so I am proud of that. And um, it talks about his becoming an instructor and in teaching, talks about the businesses he owned and how he developed products. He was one of the people who developed um, button rifling. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, I found out right as I was putting the book together at the end that it was he and G.R. Douglas did it kind of in partnership. Oh, really? Yeah, and Douglas put, out a, put in for a patent and I, I believe received the patent for their button rifling system. Hmm. And I was talking to one of the employees at Douglas Barrels and he told me, he says, this is no secret. He said, I'm just going to tell you. He said, the stuff they put in the patent is mostly BS. <laughs> he, he said it was just to get the patent. Okay, gotcha. You know, he said the, the way we actually do rifling versus what hmm. was in the patent are not the same thing. And I thought it's that was funny. Almost a red herring of sorts. I guess, but I mean, <laughs> it, of course the patent's expired, so it yeah. kind of doesn't matter. But, sure. But he was making the point that, you know, even back then they were trying to protect their proprietary methodology. Yep. You know, and uh, part of how I found out that, that they had worked together on it was I found a letter that uh, Ackley wrote to um, Boo Miller, who was a, a gunsmith over in the Kalispell area at that time, mm -hmm. and he was making barrels and stuff, and he wrote him a letter and said, I can sell you this system, you just have to call it premium rifle barreling. Hmm. 
for rifling. And, and if you look back at the Douglas paperwork, all of their stuff is premium rifling. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> so, so <laughs> he was clearly trying to figure out a way to make money off the process. Right. And, uh, and <laughs> it, he knew that it was gonna be a hard sell. In the letter he said, you're not gonna believe me, but you can rifle a barrel in 30 seconds. Because they were all doing cut rifling, and it, it takes multiple passes, and it takes a long time, mm -hmm. and no matter how good your system is, there's a time thing involved. Sure. You know, so, um, very interesting man. He spent his whole life experimenting. He had an incredible curiosity about everything. Mm -hmm. So if you told him some wives' tale about guns, <laughs> he would immediately start thinking, how can I test that? Mm -hmm. And because he made barrels, he could afford to make a barrel to test something. Yeah. Um, and did all kinds of stuff. And they said there was a, a scrap dealer that came to his place and picked up steel scrap periodically. Yeah. And the guy was amazed that everything he picked up was barrels that were cut up in little pieces. <laughs> and, and he told him, he said, well, I'm, you know, he said, I, these are either stuff I've taken off of a customer's gun or it's yeah. an experiment that I ran. Right. And um, if, he, if he didn't like the results of the experiment, the barrel got cut up. Yeah. You know? And of course, he was constantly moving on to the next thing, so the, the old barrel had no value. <laughs> sure. So, Interesting characters. All right, let's fast forward for a second to Chambering Rifles for Accuracy. This is the right. book that you wrote with Gordy. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys have seen this book here on the channel. I use Gordy's checklist in there typically when I'm chambering. Just I like the way it's laid out, right. and I've taken his class and all that. You wrote the other half of the book, right? which takes a completely different approach. And just so Gordy knows, I wrote the front half of the book. That's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is essentially focused on hunting class rifles. Right. And and you take a different approach. Mm -hmm. you, your process requires a different level of investment. Right. And we're gonna do that process. We are, and uh, that video will be a lot of fun, but I mean, in terms of explaining the book, mm -hmm. it's just as you said, <clears throat> we knew that Gordy was gonna write about his method and bench rest quality. Mm -hmm. And my goal was to write about the average blue collar guy who might be wanting to learn to gunsmith. Yeah. Or a gunsmith who's getting started and doesn't have anybody to train him. Sure. And um, so the methodology in my portion of it is geared towards minute of angle, hunting type guns, and the things you need to do to accomplish that all the time. Yeah. You know, there's there's no point in building guns, in, you know, the old Townsend Whalen thing, <laughs> only accurate guns are interesting. Right. Right. So customers don't want guns that shoot three minutes of angle. They want guns sure. that shoot under a minute. Yeah. So the processes that are in the front half of the book are designed to deliver that kind of accuracy every time uh, without having to worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about how to do it on lever guns. We talk about how to do it on bolt guns. And basically it's designed around you just need a good lathe, a basic lathe. Um, a lot of the pictures that are in there about, for my part of it, how to do stuff, were done on a, an inexpensive Chinese lathe. You know, um, mm -hmm. back when Enco was in business, it came from them. Gotcha. And um, it's it, it's the man who knows his tools can do amazing things kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that machine has some run out. It has a couple of other little problems. The the motor's a little underpowered. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing what the machine will do to get the results. I don't. Yeah. I don't. You know, I don't dissuade anybody from getting a good machine that they can afford. Yeah. But if you can't afford that, if you get grandpa's lathe, yep. or you know, you pick something up out of the local trader magazine or whatever, and it's not expensive, but it still runs good. No DRO, et cetera. Yeah. Right. You can still learn how to do this stuff on mm -hmm. a pretty good budget. And of course, yeah. you know, a little self promotion here, if you rent the tools, you can do it without spending mm -hmm. a lot of money on tools. Mm -hmm. So So that's another book to look at. And a video to check out just to give you guys a sneak peek. We've got a Ruger American 350 Legend, and we're going to do a, a kind of a low tech rebarreling for 300 Blackout. Right. And that's going to be fun. So you're going to want to check out that video. And the other books, like I said, if you click on that first link in the video description, I'll have essentially a copy of the listings for, for those books. A lot of different topics. The primer is great. We'll include the link for that. And, uh, Fred, I want to thank you. This has been absolutely awesome. We're having a great time. I wish you all could be here to hang out with us. And uh, we got to wrap things up because we're going to start the build today. What do you think? That's awesome. I'm, I'm excited about <laughs> doing that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, so 40rentals.com is going to get you to the tools to rent. If you click on that first link in the video description, I'll have links to all of the books. 
And that pretty much concludes this video, and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. Also, make your voice heard. If you have something to say, please drop a comment. Make sure you're subscribed with notifications because you're not going to want to miss the awesome content that is coming up. And finally, flex your reloading pride. You could look great in one of these t-shirts. We've got multiple designs at the Ultimate Reloader store. I'll see you later because I'm off to go shoot. Thank you.